Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Let me start with the macro thoughts because there's plenty to consider. Northman Trader, who I follow on Twitter, tweeted, The Chinese now know to get the trade deal they want, US markets need to drop harder. Um, David Rosenberg, the White House is now delaying the tariffs and removing some items. Did some acronym called the SPX cause someone to blink? And I wrote about this in my article over the weekend, the feedback loop phenomenon. Um, and then uh, Northman Trader again, real headline of the day, greatest economy ever, can't handle a little tariff for Christmas. Northman Trader again, you can't play 3D chess if you don't know the pieces move. And that goes back to tariff wars, who blinks first, something I wrote about in July last year. The blink wasn't the surprise. Trump has an election to win after all and can't afford a recession in 2020. The surprise was that it came so soon. But to weaken your hand just two weeks later is quite the feat. And going back to the article um, I wrote, I said the offshore renminbi, and let me check where it is today, 7.04, popped through 7 Monday last, sending a shiver through global markets. The markets emit signals, and the signal the market was emitting was that there was a precise correlation coefficient between a weaker yuan and weaker S&P 500 futures. Hayek and Keynes, today is the day Trump may start to realize the real economic consequences of his trade dispute. He's likely felt like a wizard until now, likely to be a bit eye-opening for him. And uh, I responded to Hayek and Cain saying he's revealed himself as the Wizard of Oz. And eventually it is revealed that Oz is actually none of these things, but rather an ordinary con man from Omaha, Nebraska, who has been using elaborate magic tricks and props. In the same article, I said, what is clear is that Xi Jinping has repelled the US advance, and this past week's Yuan price action was a message delivered with finesse and subtlety whose import cannot be ignored. The point is this, the Yuan is now the catalyst, and China has signaled it will be a shock absorber and Xi Jinping is also signaling he has control now of the console. Bovell underscore GM, the orange Don, has effectively checkmated himself. China was never going to and never will acquiesce to the demands of a foreign nation. So Trump will either have to soften his stance and look weak to get a deal, or stay firm and let the stock market crash. And as I said on the 5th of August, the most important currency to watch is the renminbi, which was last at uh, 7.04. Home thoughts return to Jorge Luis Borges with relief, with humiliation, with terror. He understood that he too was a mere appearance dreamt by another. And then I like this poem, Adam cast forth. Was there a garden or was the garden a dream? 
Amid the fleeting light, I have slowed myself and queried, almost for consolation, if the bygone period over which this Adam, wretched now, once reigned supreme, might not have been just a magical illusion of that God I dreamed. Already it's imprecise in my memory, the clear paradise, but I know it exists in flower and profusion. Although not for me, my punishment for life is the stubborn earth with the incestuous strife of Cain's and Abel's and their brood, I await no pardon. Yet it's much to have loved, to have known true joy, to have had, if only for just one day, the experience of touching the living garden. And then this is always stuck in my mind. Mirrors and copulation are abominable since they both multiply the numbers of men. And then I came across his poem, Mirrors. I have been horrified before all mirrors, not just before the impenetrable glass, the end and the beginning of that space, inhabited by nothing but reflections, but faced with spectacular water mirroring the other blue within its bottomless sky, incised at times by the illusory flight of inverted birds or troubled by a ripple, or face to face with the unspeaking surface of ghostly ebony whose very hardness reflects as if within a dream the whiteness of spectral marble or a spectral rose. Mirrors of metal and the shrouded mirror of sheer mahogany which in the twilight of its uncertain red softens the face that watches and in turn is watched by it. I look on them as infinite elemental fulfillers of a very ancient pact to multiply the world as in the act of generation, sleepless and dangerous. The glass is watching us, and if a mirror hangs somewhere on the four walls of my room, I am not alone. There's another, a reflection which in the dawn enacts its own dumb show. Claudius, king for an evening, king in a dream, did not know he was a dream until the day on which an actor mined his felony with silent artifice in a tableau. Strange that there are dreams, that there are mirrors, strange that the ordinary worn-out ways of every day encompass the imagined and endless universe woven by reflections. God has created nights well populated with dreams crowded with mirror images so that man may feel that he is nothing more than vain reflection. That's what frightens us. Political Reflections Kashmir on the Edge of the Abyss, Tarek Alley in the New York Books. In an unsettled world amid violent wars and imperial occupations, with all norms ruthlessly cast aside, did Kashmir really have a chance to be free? As unrest spreads India, the vaunted world's largest democracy, as imposed total communications blackout, Kashmir is cut off from the world. For almost half a century, Kashmir has been ruled from Delhi with the utmost brutality. Since the 1980s, India has pursued a colonial-style military occupation, replete with bribery, threats, state terrorism, disappearances, and so on. 
Clearly, the responsibility for this rests with the Indian government, but Delhi was assisted by the unutterable stupidity of the Pakistani generals and their ISI agency during the late 1980s and early 1990s. They mistook what was essentially a US Cold War triumph against the Soviets in Afghanistan that used the Pakistanis and the jihadists as pawns, but left them genuinely believing it was their victory. The jihadi groups responsible, then known as the Mujahideen, had been treated by Reagan and Thatcher, not to mention liberal media outlets in the West as freedom fighters. This type of praise went to the heads of their ISI patrons. A similar exercise in Kashmir, Pakistan's generals assumed might lead to another win. The revocation of Article 370, which protected Kashmir's demography by restricting residency to Kashmiris alone and under a subsection known as Article 35A forbade the sale of property to non-Kashmiris and the planned division of Kashmir into three separate Bantustan statelets bear hallmarks of the Israeli occupation in Palestine. In October 1947, the Nehru government in Delhi, with the backing of its British commander-in-chief and the support of the peacenik Mahatma Gandhi, airlifted in Indian troops, pressured the Maharaja to accede to India and occupied the bulk of the province, the snowy bosom of the Himalayas, in Nehru's words. And then he's quoting, uh, Nehru again in the bitter chill, uh, poet, poet Iqbal, in the bitter chill of winter shivers his naked body, whose skill wraps the rich in royal shawls. Um, and essentially, uh, you know, this is the Xinjiang uh, Gaza Strip model that's being applied, I'm afraid. Uh, a shopkeeper describing how soldiers burst into his premises and opened fire for no reason at all. Images of deserted streets, I fear that the Kashmiri people isolated from and by the world are smelling the night air on the edge of the abyss. Uh, Iqbal, I have seen the movement of the sinews of the sky and the blood coursing in the veins of the moon. Let this be our beautiful departure from stagnation. Let our minds come alive, enter another dimension, go beyond the stars, eagerly struggling to find that which our naked eyes did not know existed. Rise like a falcon born to soar and not be alone but be present amongst others. Jeffrey Epstein had a collection of eyeballs on his wall. They were originally made for injured soldiers, we're told, which presumably means they are artificial. The eyeballs make sense because Epstein was a watcher. He watched the young girls whose lives he shattered. His depravity was of a deeply visual nature. His young victims tended to be thin, athletic and blonde, white in skin and easily imagined in white tennis outfits. That fits with our dominant culture's visual vocabulary of innocence and purity, a vision Epstein methodically defiled over and over for no reason except that's how he got off. Is it a coincidence that we all live in a watch-and-collect digital economy? Maybe, but we feast upon each other in the 21st century. The bullshitter who pitched MBS on the NEO project was undoubtedly cut from the Epstein mould. He was, in the words of the New York Times, not closely monitored. Jeffrey Epstein was a spy in a society of spies. He was a collector in a collector's economy. He was a watcher, and he died while nobody was watching. 
Autopsy finds broken bones in Jeffrey Epstein's neck, deepening questions around his death. Among the bones broken in his neck was the hyoid bone, which in men is near the Adam's apple. Such breaks can occur in those who hang themselves, according to forensics experts, but they're more common in victims of homicide by strangulation. And that took me back to an article I wrote about the Crown Prince, and I quoted him saying, how can I communicate with them? while they prepare for the arrival of Almadi al-Montazar. Howard French, writing in World Politics Review, how a crackdown in Hong Kong would reverberate from Shanghai to Taiwan. A drive to the airport in Shanghai from an outlying suburb earlier this week revealed an entirely new city to me. Brand new high-rise apartments rose in thick clusters in the near distance as new access roads zigged, zagged and looped around new train and subway stations. The two cities have long been linked and they remain so today, a fact obscured by the ongoing protests in Hong Kong so unimaginable in present-day Shanghai. Modern Hong Kong was populated to a substantial degree by people from Shanghai fleeing Communist Party rule in the aftermath of the Civil War and revolution that brought Mao Zedong to power in 1949. They helped create Hong Kong's famous entrepreneurial spirit as well as its attachment to civil liberties on such vivid display in the rolling protests against a hand-handed attempt in June by the city's chief executive, Carrie Lam, to introduce a law providing for extradition of suspected criminals to mainland China. Under the leadership of President Xi Jinping, China has swelled with new wealth and a confidence to match, bordering on the cocksure. Early in his rule, Xi famously spoke of a few foreigners with full bellies of nothing better to do than point their fingers at us. Then it clumsily pushed a so-called patriotic education campaign, mistakenly thinking that mainland-style indoctrination could work or even be accepted in a place with well-established liberal traditions. The danger here is that Beijing believes its own propaganda, that the unrest in Hong Kong has been brought on by evil foreign forces rather than by its own actions and by normal human aspirations. With little difficulty, China could of course swallow up Hong Kong tomorrow, but as much as the leadership in Beijing hates instability and abhors the idea of backing down to civilian demands, that would be a very bad mistake. He concludes by saying the destruction of Hong Kong as we know it, if things come to that, will make international businesses more sceptical about Shanghai, not less, and China's golden back door will be bolted shut. 17th of June, I said the periphery is a boil that will not be lanced. And previously I called the tinderbox, the periphery a tinderbox. Have a look at a link with Howard French, the Q&A session, when I had a chance to pose a few questions which I think are relevant specifically to understanding the man, Xi Jinping. Few foresaw the extent of Xi's ambition before he took over as leader of foreign affairs. People who have limited experience with power, those who have been far away from it, tend to regard these things as mysterious and novel. But I look past the superficial things, the power, the flowers, the glory and the applause. I see the detention houses and the fickleness of human nature. That gave me an understanding of politics on a deeper level, he said. 
Z took his greatest warning from the fall of the Soviet Union and was horrified at how the Soviet Communist Party had evaporated almost overnight. A big party was gone just like that, he said in a 2012 speech. Proportionally, the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. 27th of May, I said, President Xi Jinping is on a pedestal and is faced with the strongman conundrum. Let's move on to international markets. And this was the trigger for a massive sell-off in the US markets, that being the US 2 10-year yield curve inversion for the first time since 2007. I think part of the problem is most dealers probably can't recall the previous uh, recession. The development has preceded every recession over the past 45 years. I wrote about this in an article called Bond Yields in Tilt Mode, and I was saying markets and prices exhibit patterns of correlation, and essentially my perspective that is that it is the correlation that has exerted a pull effect on US yields, and that therefore the recessionary signaling of the yield curve should be discounted. The Dow tanked 800 points in its worst day of 2019. And then I agree with Hayek and Keynes again, something very important happened. The market gave Trump the finger. He tried to sweet talk it with tweets and it didn't care. I don't know if this means he's lost his charm, but it's important. And I responded by saying the law of exponentially diminishing returns, the Dow Jones and Z have Trump in a pincer. Let's move on to the currency markets. Uh, Euro dollar 111.44, dollar index 97.943, Japanese yen 106.24, Swiss franc 0.9745, the pound pushing a little bit higher, 120.80. The Australian dollar had a good move, yes, 0.6779, unlikely to hold it, frankly. Indian rupee, 71.4075, South Korean one, 12.14.45. Brazilian real, that's popped over 4.40517. Egyptian pound, 16.5583 and the rand 15.3024. This is a dollar index chart from Bond Crypt, and uh, it's been a long grind, but it's going steadily higher, but it's been weighed down by safe haven demand for the Swiss franc and the Japanese yen. Euro dollar 111.44, I still see us dropping below 110. Gold, well, this has been a phenomenon this year, last at 15, 13, 60. Um, uh, this is a chart from T Commodity. Um, I think it's running out of breath here. Crude oil, huge up day, a day before yesterday, down day uh, yesterday, and now at $55.22, but very volatile. Brazil's central bank announced it will sell dollars from its foreign reserves for the first time in more than a decade following a sharp depreciation of the real. Let's move on to Africa. Zimbabwe's economic crisis has reached a breaking point. That's the Financial Times' David Pilly. When Zimbabweans are expressing nostalgia for Robert Mugabe, you know things must be bad. Yet it is now common to hear things are worse under Emerson Mnangagwa, president since the 2017 coup, then during the darkest days of the man he deposed. Zimbabwe is in humanitarian meltdown, food is in such short supply, that some people have stopped taking their HIV medicine because they cannot afford to pay for the meals that must accompany tablets. Worst drought in 40 years, 
but saying make no mistake the main cause of Zimbabwe's suffering is economic mismanagement. A few years ago the government introduced bond notes and electronic money which goes by the catchy name of real-time gross settlement dollars. These were pegged at a fictional one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar that though there were almost no reserves to back them up, the fiction is now over. In June, an effort to normalize the whole crazy system, the government abolished the use of dollars, restoring the fantastical RTGS currency as its sole store of value. Printing stopped, the imaginary peg was abandoned, and RTGS dollars now worth 10 US cents. Savings have been laid to waste. People have reached breaking point. The opposition is calling for a nationwide strike on Friday. The last time it took similar action in January, security forces reacted with jackbooted ferocity. We now need to work, roll up our sleeves, and we as a people be our own liberators. Nelson Chamisa uh, doesn't have the charisma or, does, uh, or the uh, uh, push to really push back. The government, mindful of popular uprisings in Algeria and Sudan, is treating the challenge as an existential threat. It will shoot to kill if necessary. ZANU-PF is past master at doing exactly that. In fact, the fault lies entirely with the party, which long ago lost its legitimacy. Zimbabwe scrapped its currency a decade ago. The country could breathe again if it scrapped its ruling party too. 29th of July, I said Zimbabwe is a laboratory experiment with inflation clocking 176%. I said there is a straw in Campbell's back moment, but predicting that moment is always a fool's errand. 21st of January this year, what is clear to me is that Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. The point I'm seeking to make is that there is a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions. Zimbabwe is a classic example. October 2018, I was talking about the government's voodoo economics where it spent $1.3 billion pump priming the economy ahead of the election, money it did not have. Very hard-hitting and deep, insightful article on Huey. Huey technicians helped African governments spy on political opponents. Huawei Technologies, the world's largest telecoms company, dominates African markets where it has sold security tools that governments use for digital surveillance and censorship. Uganda uh, Cyber Surveillance Unit had strict orders to intercept Bobby Wine's encrypted communications using the broad powers of a 2010 law that gives the government the ability to secure its multi-dimensional interests. The Huawei technicians worked for two days and helped us puncture through some one senior officer at the surveillance unit. In Zambia, according to security officials there, Huawei technicians helped the government access the phones and Facebook pages of a team of opposition bloggers running a pro-opposition news site which had repeatedly criticized President Edgar Lungu. Senior security officials identified by name two Huawei experts based in a cyber surveillance unit in the offices of Zambia's telecom regulator who pinpointed the bloggers' locations and were in constant contact with police units deployed to arrest them. The ruling Patriotic Front posted on its Facebook page in April that police officers working with Chinese experts at Huawei have managed to track and arrest the bloggers. The party spokesman confirmed to the journal that the case was handled by the Cyber Crime Crack Squad, the unit of the telecom regulator. Many of the projects are rudimentary. Huawei has sold advanced video surveillance and facial recognition systems in more than two dozen developing countries, 
according to data gathered by Stephen Felstein. Johnson Controls declined to comment. I Omniscience said it has provided behavioral analytics products through Huawei in the Middle East but not in Africa. We are not at liberty to publicly reveal the specifics. This is Okondo in Uganda. Deny that the government is targeting Bobby Wine. Um, saying the opposition lawmaker isn't such an important issue to warrant heightened surveillance. Huawei has connected hundreds of millions of African consumers since first doing business in Kenya in 1998. It has built telecom networks in some 40 African nations by offering inexpensive deals, often financed by loans with favorable terms, and by providing on-the-ground customer service. Huawei now dominates Africa's internet business. In recent years, it has expanded into digital surveillance systems. It's well worth reading that article in full, and it really is very good. Uh, the deal with Huawei's and survivor strategy to consolidate power, Bobby Wine. It's an all-out assault. Huawei technicians helped intercept the communications of opposition bloggers running a new site named Cosway of a Rat, which had repeatedly criticized Mr. Lungan. This is a photograph of Huawei officers in Lusaka, Zambia. Surveillance cameras are common around Kampala, that's from the Wall Street Journal. I wrote in December 2018 about the truce dinner and the arrest of the Huawei CFO. And I said then an important market for Huawei has been Africa. In fact, Huawei is the bloodstream of Africa's telecom infrastructure. How this plays out in Africa is now an above the radar issue. South African oil shares up 2.45% year to date, six month low. I've written about the RAND before. I called it the purest proxy for the China, Asia, EM, and frontier markets feedback loop phenomenon. Dollar RAND 15.28, I think it's going lower. Egyptian pound 16.56, having expectations of a rate cut. Egypt's 30 up 11.54% year to date popped higher last few sessions as the market anticipated a rate cut. Nigeria all shared down 13.83% year to date and at more than a two year low. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index minus 6.11% year to date. Namibia's central bank cut rates for the first time in two years in a bid to boost the economy. Coming to Kenya, KCB reported half-year earnings per share increased 5.063%. Um, loans and advances to customers grew 13.576%. Total operating income up 8.276%. EPS up 5.063%. Paying an interim dividend unchanged, one shilling a share. You, in this visual, you see the overall performance summary. They tweeted that international bank subsidiaries continued to perform well with all but one Uganda of the businesses delivering high double-digit earnings growth. Lends and advances grew 23%. Fees and commissions increased by 31% to $8.9 billion as revenues from digital channels, in particular KCB and PESA, grew significantly powered by the new platform launched late last year. It trades on a price to book of 1.1, the P is 5.064, it's inexpensive and a value proposition. Credit to the private sector grew by 4.3% in March 2019 compared to 2.1% in March 2018, Growth of credit to government increased by 7.1% in March 2018 to 54.3% in 2019. That's the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis. Kakuzi reported half-year earnings per share declined 9.2%. Sales grew 1.035%. EPS down 9.2% saying there was an increase in revenue from avocado sales, lower volume of unharvested avocado uh, crop resulted in a reduction in the fair value adjustment compared to the previous
graph period. Revenue from tea declined, macadamia results improved as a result of better production. And uh, let me just finish off giving you the core data. The shilling is at 103.30, holding in there. Nairobi all shares up 5.83% year to date. NSE 20 is down 10.44%. And that's a multi-10 year low. Thank you for stopping by.